Now, karma is so important in Buddhism because our willed actions produce effects. Our willed actions, our karmas, have two kinds of effects. One is the immediately visible psychological effect. The other is a special kind of karmic effect. First of all, karma is important because our volitional actions, one by one, determine our characters, our personalities, the total quality of our being. Every willed action that we perform has a certain tendency to repeat itself, to reproduce itself in the future. It's somewhat like a protozoan, like an amoeba. And when the action is performed, then it leaves a track on the mind, an imprint, which can mark the beginning of a new mental tendency. As these actions multiply, then they form our character. Our character, our being, our personality is nothing really but the sum of all of our willed actions, a kind of cross-section of all our accumulated karmas. So by yielding first in simple ways to the unwholesome impulses of the mind, then we build up little by little a greedy character, a hostile, aggressive character, a deluded character. On the other hand, by resisting these unwholesome desires, by replacing them by their opposites, by the wholesome qualities, then we can develop generous characters, loving and compassionate personality. We can become wise and enlightened beings. These changes don't come suddenly, they don't come overnight, but they build up little by little. And the way they come is by changing our karmas, our action patterns. By changing the action patterns, one by one, we transform our habits. First, it's slow and difficult, but as we gain experience and familiarity, then it becomes natural to us. As we change our habits, we change our character. As we change our character, we change our total being, our whole world. That's why the Buddha emphasizes so strongly the importance of being mindful of every action, of every choice. Because every deed we perform, every choice we make, has tremendous potential for the future. The Buddha compares the process of our, of our development to the filling of a bucket. If we put a bucket under a leaking tap, then the bucket doesn't get filled with just one, two, or three drops of water from the tap. But if we leave the bucket under the tap for an hour or two hours, then it will become full to the top with water. In the same way, we transform ourselves for good or for bad, by our individual willed actions, which each leave their imprint, their impression on the mind, which each form the track of a new mental tendency. So that's the psychological effect of karma. But then karma is also very important, because karma has the ability to ripen in the future, the ability to produce results in accordance with a universal moral law. Whenever we perform a deliberate action, an act with intention, that action deposits a seed in the mind, a seed with a potency to bring about effects in the future. These effects correspond to the nature of the, of the original action. They follow from the ethical tone of the action. So our unwholesome commas bounce back to us. They lead us to states of harm and suffering. In the same way, our wholesome commas also eventually return to us, leading to our happiness and to our well-being. 
Seen from this angle, the angle of the comic law, the universe appears to maintain a certain moral equili equilibrium, a balance between all the morally significant deeds and the situations of those who perform them. So the law of karma is a moral application of the old principle that for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. However, the working of karma isn't mechanical. Karma is willed action, and the will is part of one of our faculties is something alive and organic. And therefore, karma allows much room for variation, for the play of living forces. First of all, not all karma has to ripen as a matter of strict necessity. Every karma, every volitional action, has a tendency to act to ripen, but it doesn't always ripen inevitably. Karma is like seeds. Seeds ripen if they meet the right conditions, but if they don't meet the right conditions, then they remain as seeds. And if they are destroyed, then they can never ripen at all in the future. Similarly, it can be said of karma that karma pushes for an opportunity to mature. It has a tendency to mature. If the karma meets the right conditions, if it finds the opportunity, then it will bring its results. But if it doesn't meet those conditions, then it won't ripen and it can even be destroyed by other karma. And it's very important to understand that our present way of life, our attitudes, conduct, and so on, can influence the way our past karmas mature. Some past karmas that we've performed are so strong that they have to come to fruition. We can't escape them at all, no matter what we do. But the greatest number of our past karmas are conditioned by the way we live now. If we live unwisely, heedlessly, this will give the past bad karmas the opportunity to produce results, and it will hinder the good karmas from producing their effects, or else it will cancel out their good effects. On the other hand, if we live wisely and diligently now, then this will work in the opposite way. It will give the opportunity to our past good karmas. It will enable them to mature, and it will bar out our bad karmas. It will weaken them, destroy them, or prevent them from coming to fruition. Another fact to be understood about karma is that karma can produce its results at different times, even in different lives. It doesn't show its result immediately. The Buddha says that there are three kinds of karmas distinguished by way of time of ripening. First, there's karma that ripens in this present lifetime. Then there's karma that will ripen in the next lifetime. And third, there's karma that will ripen in some lifetime after the next. This last kind of karma, this is the strongest. If the other two kinds, the first two kinds, don't find an opening, then they become defunct. They'll never ripen if they don't ripen either in the present life or in the next life. But this third kind of karma remains with us as long as we continue in samsara. As long as we're subject to rebirth, it can find its opportunity. It can bring its results even hundreds and thousands of aeons in the future. Now this time lag sometimes helps us understand what might seem to be a discrepancy in the working of karma. Sometimes we see good people who meet with a lot of suffering and then bad people who meet with great success, with good fortune. That comes about because of the time lag and the maturing of karma. The good man is re reaping the results of bad karma from the past, maybe from past lives. But 
in the future he will eventually gain the pleasant results from the good karma he's performing now. And in the opposite way, the bad man is enjoying good fortune because of the he's reaping the results of his past good karma. But in the future, when his bad karma that he's performing now matures, then he will eventually meet with suffering. There's no escape from this balance that eventually tends to bring good results for good actions and bad results for bad actions. And the working of karma is so complex and so subtle that it's almost impossible to make definite predictions. All that we can know with certainty are the tendencies, and that's enough to guide our actions. Now, karma produces its results in different ways. In two general ways it comes to fruition can be distinguished. One is to produce the type of rebirth the basic rebirth consciousness. The other way is to produce the various results that we meet with in the course of life. At the time of death, one particular dominant karma comes to the forefront of the mind and it steers the stream of consciousness to the new existence. Then once this takes place, once rebirth takes place, then during the course of life other karmas mature bringing either favorable results success, wealth, increased talents, spiritual progress and so on or else bringing unfavorable results poverty, misfortune, suffering, spiritual obstacles so on now this functioning of karma the way good karma brings good results and bad karma brings bad results, this is an entirely natural process. It's part of the built-in structure of events, not something imposed on things by any outside power. Each action has the ability to produce the result appropriate to itself just through the nature of the action itself. This is called the Kamanayama, the order of kama, which functions autonomously. And the good and bad results that come from the wholesome and unwholesome actions, these are not rewards and punishments. Actions produce their results naturally through the law of cause and effect working in the moral realm. There's no director, no supervisor standing over it. Now we might mention some specific cases that show the working of karma in our lives. In the human world we see that some people have long lives, some short lives. Some are always healthy, some are often sick, some are beautiful, some are ugly, and so on. The question might arise, what are the causes for these differences? In a sutta, the Buddha explained in a detailed way how karma is the cause behind all these differences in the fortunes of beings. He says that the reason why some people die prematurely is because in the past they destroyed life. The karmic result of killing is to be short-lived. Other people live long lives. The cause, the Buddha says, is that in previous lives they were kind and compassionate. They had respect and reverence for life. Some people are very sickly. The cause for that, in the past they injured and hurt other beings. Some people are always healthy. These are the people who helped others, who gave and assisted others. Then those who are often angry and harsh in the past, they become ugly. Those who are patient and cheerful, they become beautiful. Some are rich. These are the people who were generous in the past. Some are poor. These are the ones who are selfish. Some are influential. These are the ones who rejoiced in the good fortune of others, who sympathized with the success of others. 
than some are weak and powerless. These are the people who are envious of the good fortune of others. Then some people are intelligent. These are the ones who were reflective and studious in the past, who always inquired and investigated matters. And then those who are dull-minded and stupid, these are the ones who were lazy and negligent in the past, who never studied, who never thought very much. From this, given by the Buddha in the Chula Kama Vibhanga Sutta, we can see that the appropriate result always follows from the specific type of kama, that each kama produces a kind of result that corresponds exactly to itself. Now we said before that kama, the main function, of, or one of the main functions of kama is to produce the basic type of rebirth to generate the rebirth consciousness. And the question comes up, which kama will take on this role? And here, kamas are ranked by way of their priority in taking on this very important role. The first priority goes to a very morally weighty, very heavy kind of action as if a person has performed a very weighty, morally significant karma in the course of his life, that karma will take on the role of generating rebirth. And there are certain types of karmas like this on the unwholesome side and on the wholesome side. On the unwholesome side, the heavy karmas are such acts as taking the life of one's mother, taking the life of one's father, taking the life of an arahant, wounding a Buddha, and causing a schism in the Sangha, in the order of monks. If a person has performed one of these actions, then that karma will come up at the time of death and determine rebirth. And where it will reproduce rebirth will be in one of these states of misery, a very painful type of rebirth involving much suffering. On the other hand, the weighty, wholesome kamas, these are the attainments of the higher meditative states, the jhanas, the stages of samadhi. These produce always a good rebirth, a rebirth in one of the higher worlds. Then, if there is no especially heavy kama, either good or bad, then the next kama to take precedence in determining rebirth will be some strong ethical karma performed close to the time of death. Thus, if somebody generates a strong, wholesome karma just before death, then even though he's lived a bad life, if he really undergoes a genuine change of heart and starts generating strong, wholesome karma, that will become a wholesome death-proximate karma which can produce a good rebirth in the next life. For example, a murderer who's about to be executed might suddenly become filled with remorse for his crimes. He might become filled with compassion for people. And then he might really wish that he could turn over a new leaf. That might lead, that state, that change of heart could lead to a favorable rebirth in the next life. It doesn't mean that he'll escape from the effects of his bad karma. His evil actions and stored up in the mind, they're present. And eventually they can catch up with him at some time. But the form of rebirth in the immediately following life will be decided by that wholesome karma that's come up just before death. On the other hand, somebody might have lived a very good life, but just before death he might become very angry, very frightened, very greedily attached to his possessions, clinging tenaciously. And then that unwholesome death-proximate karma, that can generate a lower type of rebirth, an unfortunate rebirth. Again, this doesn't mean that he'll miss out on the fruits of his good deeds. Those good deeds can still produce their effects, either in the next life or in some future existence. But for the next life, the bad karma will take on the determinative role. Then, if there's no very significant death-proximate karma, good or bad, 
the next karma that will come up to generate rebirth will be habitual karma some action that we've performed habitually in the course of our lifetime and in the overwhelming majority of cases it's habitual karma that causes rebirth but if there's no special significant habitual karma then some other miscellaneous karma can, that has been performed and stored up this can come up to the mind at the time of death and bring about rebirth this ele- introduces the element of uncertain uncertainty or unpredictability about the rebirth process that there are sometimes these very unexpected occasions when some stored up karma from the distant past suddenly comes up and takes on the rebirth determining role the next topic to be discussed is the plane of existence where karma produces rebirth and this requires a little overview a short survey of the buddhist cosmology the buddhist picture of the universe <laughs> buddhism divides the whole of sentient existence into three basic realms one is called the sense sphere realm another the realm of fine materiality the third the immaterial or formless realm the sense sphere realm has six divisions there are the hells which are states of intense torment and suffering then there's the sphere of the petas the petas are afflicted spirits sometimes called hungry ghosts beings with strong tormenting desires hunger and thirst that they can never satisfy they're usually depicted in buddhist art as beings with very big bellies tremendous bellies and very small mouth the mouth the size of a pinhole and they are always tormented by strong hunger and thirst and they go looking for food and drink but they can never get enough of it the next is the animal kingdom the realm of animals where the dominant characteristic of beings is dullness of mind and strong brute like desires the next sphere is called the sphere of the asuras the asura world the asuras are titanic beings dominated by strong passion by the desire for power ambition competitiveness they are frequently fighting with the deities with the gods and the heavens jealous of the fortune of the gods Now these four realms the hells the animal realm the world of pratas and the world of the asuras are together called the plane of misery and all of these states of rebirth are considered unfortunate undesirable states of rebirth then in the sense sphere realm there are two good planes of rebirth one is the human world the other is the heavenly world the worlds of the devas the sense sphere contains six heavenly planes and the beings who live there enjoy long life beauty happiness power and so on but life in all the heavenly planes is impermanent subject to pass away and therefore the heavens aren't the goal the object of aspiration for those following the buddhist path to liberation rebirth takes place into those realms as a result of good karma but those seeking to go beyond the round of rebirth to attain nibbana don't make the heavenly realms their ultimate aim in fact the buddha points out that of all the planes of existence the most fortunate from the standpoint of seeking liberation is the human world the reason is because the human world exhibits a balance of all the different forces it exhibits the qualities of being a middle way on the one hand life there is n- not so unbearably filled with suffering that thought and reflection are not possible it allows enough pleasure enough ease and comfort that we can reflect on the nature of existence and that we can develop our understanding on the other hand life in the human world is not so 
intensely pleasant and enjoyable and long in duration like the heavenly world so that we become deceived by the pleasure into taking enjoyment as always the final end of life so we become deceived by the long lifespan into think, thinking that our lives are eternal but it has just the balance of pleasure and of pain it has enough pain also that we become awakened to the unsatisfactory nature of existence it's short enough so that we become aware of the truth of impermanence now rebirth into the plains of misery into the four unhappy states of existence comes about to ten unwholesome courses of action these are given as taking life stealing engaging in sexual misconduct that is adultery and seduction speaking falsehood speaking slander speaking harshly speaking gossip and idle chatter than having a mind of covetousness a mind of ill will and holding wrong views these unwholesome commas if they take on the rebirth producing role bring about rebirth in the plane of misery then the cause for rebirth in the fortunate planes of the sense sphere in the human world and in the sense sphere heavenly world that is the 10 courses of wholesome action that is abstaining from the 10 unwholesome ones also the performance of works of merit that is practicing generosity giving gifts and help to others observing moral discipline and developing the simple forms of meditation developing the meditations on loving kindness developing some purity of mind when these become take on the rebirth generating role then they produce rebirth into the human world and into the sense sphere heavenly world then a, beyond the sense sphere heaven there is the realm of fine material form the realm of subtle matter and rebirth into this realm comes about through the certain high meditative attainments called the jhanas states of deep concentration deep absorption when the mind becomes pure serene very focused and all the thought processes quiet down and the jhanas have different levels of depth and when they are attained and mastered and kept at the time of death then they produce rebirth in one of the heavens of the fine material realm according to their level of depth these states of existence in the fine material realm these are much purer even than the sense sphere realm here the mind becomes very pure very luminous the life span is incredibly long lasting for aeons and aeons and the coarse types of matter don't exist in these realms there remains only subtle very fine material form eventually though life in these realms also comes to an end and the person who has been reborn there will pass away and takes on rebirth elsewhere as determined by his karma then beyond the four jhanas there are four higher levels of samadhi called the four formless attainments states of deep extremely deep concentration that is the sphere of infinite space the sphere of infinite consciousness the sphere of nothingness and the sphere of neither perception nor non-perception and those who attain these states of concentration master them and possess them at the time of be- of death these persons will take rebirth in the immaterial realm in the formless realm here all material form all matter comes to an end these states of existence are entirely mental the mind exists there without any material base absorbed in pure peace pure equanimity for thousands of aeons but in this case too the karma that brought rebirth here eventually becomes exhausted the lifetime comes to an end and the beings take rebirth elsewhere 
as determined by their karma. Now a question might be come up, might be raised, whether a Western person with a scientific education can really believe this cosmology seems to be ancient, outdated, and superstitious. And here I'll have to give my personal answer. It seems to me that while some of the details of the cosmology might be subject to question, I feel that there are good reasons for regarding the general form of this cosmology as quite tenable. If we can see the logic behind the law of karma, then if we consider the different kinds of actions people are capable of performing, it seems that there has to be an appropriate plane of existence for the maturation of the different types of karma. If there are certain very bad karmas, like killing thousands of people cruelly and heartlessly, in order for that karma to meet its due compensation, we need an appropriate plane of existence where it can bring its fruit. Thus, for such kinds of karma, we need a realm of intense suffering the hell realm. Then on the other hand, if somebody has performed very noble deeds, he gives up all his wealth, his limbs, his life for the sake of others, if this person has very pure conduct, a very loving and compassionate mind, that state of being also needs a corresponding realm to produce its due results. That is the heavenly realm. Also, once we understand the different meditative attainments, the jhanas and the formless attainments, and see how those are higher levels of consciousness, very different from the familiar ones, it becomes clear that they correspond to other planes of existence of an equivalent nature to themselves. And thus the whole picture fits together very logically. But the specially determining reason is found in our own mind. If we look into our own mind, we can see that all of these different planes are already contained there in seed form. The dominant forces in our minds will be human states, states tied to the human world, since that is the basic tone of our consciousness. But at times there will arise states of intense hatred, which might express itself as violence and cruelty. Those states, at that moment, we are constructing for ourselves a hell world. We are, psychologically, we might be living in the hell. And karmically, those states are the seeds of rebirth into the hell. At other times, very noble thoughts will arise. Thoughts that make us feel divine or heavenly. Thoughts of supreme generosity, of great kindness and compassion. These thoughts, when they arise, our world becomes very light and pure, almost like a heavenly world. And these states, in fact, are the seeds of rebirth to the heavenly world. They are the channel that leads upwards, the ladder that leads to the heavenly state. In our states of blind desire, our brutishness, our blind lust, our dull stupidity, we can see the mind of the animal. We can understand those states to be the seeds of the animal world. And when we indulge in them, we're constructing a rebirth into the animal world. We can see sometimes selfishness, possessiveness, intense clinging. At that time, our mind becomes similar to that of a praetor, an afflicted spirit. And we're constructing or planting the seeds of rebirth into the world of the papers. Again, there will come up states of greed for power, jealousy and envy, competitiveness, the urge for power. At that time, we have the mind of an Azura, and we're laying the foundations for rebirth into the world of the Azura. All these realms of existence are already present in us as seeds in our own mind. So what really lies behind this whole picture, behind all the planes of rebirth, is the mind. The Buddha says that mind is the architect of the whole universe. We shouldn't think of the rebirth process in terms of the image of a human being just appearing in different realms, moving from realm to realm. 
what lies behind the whole cosmos with all of its different realms of existence is the mind. The different tendencies in the mind, its different volitions, desires, actions, simply spell themselves out as the different planes of existence. And all these planes are simply the visible manifestations, the outer projections of the forces at work in the mind, of the different volitions that arise and become accumulated inwardly in the mental continuum. Thus the outer world with its different planes of existence is the visible register of the volitional tendencies built up and stored in the mind. And these planes simply provide the field for the mind to work out its accumulated tendencies. The Buddha says that the mind is the maker of all the world, the leader, the thing that dominates and governs all other things. And all the outward diversifications found in the world, these correspond to the diversifications of the mind, of volition. All of that is the concrete expression of the volitions in the mind coming out into the open. Now the twin teachings on karma and rebirth have several important implications for getting a correct perspective on our lives. First of all, they imply that the objective situation in which we find ourselves now is exactly the situation appropriate for ourselves. We can't blame our troubles on our environment, on our heredity, on faith, on our upbringing, and so on. All these factors have made us what we are, but the reason we've met with these circumstances is because of our past karma. According to the Buddha's teaching, we're fully responsible for what we are. We've planted the seeds in the past, and now we're reaping the results. Even our personalities are the products of our mental formations established over many lives. We inherit the results of our own actions. This might seem to be, at first, a pessimistic doctrine. It seems to imply that we're the prisoner of our past karma, that we're bound in by our old actions and just have to submit to their effects. But this view would be a distortion. It's true that very often we have to reap that we have to reap the results of our past karma. But the important point to understand is that karma is volitional action, and volitional action takes place in the present always and only in the present. This means that in the present we have the ability to change the entire direction of our lives. Our world space is not only a matter of objective circumstances, our environment and so on, but also of our subjective frame of mind. If we examine our lives close up, we'll see that our experience falls into two groups into experiences that come to us passively, which we receive independently of our choice, and experiences which we create ourselves through our choices and attitudes. The first, the objective circumstances, the passive side of experience, that is largely the effect of past karma, and that we generally have to face no matter what we think of it. But within those limitations, there is a space the tremendous space of the present moment in which we can construct a world with our own minds now. If we let ourselves be dominated by selfishness, hatred, ambition, dullness, then even if we're wealthy and powerful and famous, we'll still be living in misery and suffering and planting the seeds for a rebirth in the world of suffering in the future. On the other hand, even though we might be poor and in bad circumstances with much pain and misfortune, if we observe pure conduct, develop a mind of generosity and kindness and understanding, then we can transform our world. We can build a world of light, of love, of peace, even a heaven on earth that all depends on the mind. Now we come to a 
special topic in the Buddhist teaching on kama, and this is the relation of kama to the path of liberation. The ultimate aim in following the path of the Buddha is not simply to achieve good results by performing good karma. That is a mundane aim, not the final aim. The highest aim, the true aim, is to get beyond the chain of karma and results. As long as we go on performing karma, accumulating karma, we remain subject to birth and death, to wandering in samsara with its different realms. And then we have to meet suffering in its different forms. Whether we're living in a fortunate world or in an unfortunate world, that is secondary. All states of existence are impermanent, without substance. All are dukkha, incapable of giving final satisfaction. Good karma binds us to good results, bad karma to bad results. But whether the results are good or bad, we're still in bondage. Our chains are still chains, whether they're made of gold or iron. The aim of following the Dharma is to reach the freedom that lies beyond karma, beyond the cycle of karma and results. That aim, that goal, is to be reached by a special type of karma, which the Buddha calls the karma that leads to the end of karma. This karma is the practice of the Noble Eightfold Path. Ordinary karma is action conditioned by clinging. If we're clinging to good, we perform good action, which leads to good results. If we're clinging to bad, we we perform bad actions, which lead to bad results. The force behind both is clinging, and clinging rests upon ignorance. But there's another kind of karma, a karma which leads beyond clinging. This is the karma of practicing the path, the karma of developing mindfulness and insight. By developing mindfulness insight, we see things as they are, as impermanent, empty phenomena, subject to conditions, rolling on through conditions. As this insight deepens, we put an end to clinging, And by eliminating clinging, we break free from the chains of karma and discover the freedom beyond karma, the freedom of liberation. The Arahant, the liberated one, doesn't generate any more karmas. He continues to act, he performs volitional actions, but his actions no longer constitute karma. They don't leave any imprint upon the mind. They don't lead to the depositing of any seed in the mental continuum with the potency to ripen in the future, to bring about rebirths or results in the future. The activities of the arahant are called kriyas, not karma. Kriya means simple actions. He acts, he performs deeds according to his will, but his deeds leave no trace on the mental continuum. They're just like the flight of birds across the sky. The Arahant has broken the chains of karma, chains of action and results, and he's reached final deliverance, the freedom from all action and bondage.